For as long as mankind has looked up at the stars, we have asked ourselves the very same question. Can I use this as a marketing opportunity? On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite into the Earth's atmosphere. For the next three weeks, Sputnik briefly became the world's worst satellite radio service, amateur operators around the globe listening in to its signal in amazement. The ease with which one could hear the satellite made for a very public demonstration of the USSR's space program and its power, and the United States, who at the time were having a bit of a spat with the Soviets over some non-space-related whatever, suddenly felt quite insecure. This insecurity would boil over into the creation of a rival space program, and the conflict would soon come to be known as not the topic of this video. Long story short, Buzz Aldrin goes here. While the two world superpowers were having fun launching rockets and not eating freeze-dried ice cream, two American companies were becoming superpowers of their own. And 20 years later, the real Cold War would begin. Coca-Cola and Pepsi were locked in competition for the public's grocery money. Coke kept the lead, but Pepsi would keep them on their toes, fighting hard and locking down a sizable segment of the market. Things were getting serious, and just as the Americans and the Soviets had done in the 50s, they realized there was only one place to go to settle the score. The Cola Wars were headed to space. Now, I'm a seasoned veteran of the Cola Wars card, but for those that don't know, the competition was fierce at the time. Pepsi was dragging random people in shopping malls into taste tests, Coke was having Bill Cosby market how untampered their drink was, there was even a promotion at some point involving cans full of untreated water. If you see anything other than Coca-Cola Classic in that can, don't drink from it! Carbonation is an interesting process. The infusion of carbon dioxide into liquid creates a unique bubbly texture and a soft bitterness that is vital to the flavor profile of any carbonated drink. These bubbles slowly rise up and out of the liquid over time, flattening it. But what would happen in zero gravity? Assuming the drink didn't separate, the bubbles would stay mixed into the liquid and fail to rise, changing the texture and flavor. Once digested, the gas would stay put in the stomach instead of separating quickly, and when it did come out, it would bring particles of liquid with it, creating a bad acid reflux-like reaction. Oh, and also pressurized cans would probably behave poorly when opened. So the dream of drinking a carbonated beverage in space seemed forever distant. And then the 80s happened. An age of science and wonder. Walt Disney World opened Epcot Center. The fine folks at SNL were developing nose problems. And the scientists at the Coca-Cola company were exploring the viability of carbonated beverages and microgravity. Not only were they considering the digestive challenges of the environment, they were also hoping to use the research to learn about how to design for different palates, like those of the elderly. And also to see if they could stop the cans from exploding. So they set to work. A short while later, and they had their solution. Using a pressurized bladder and an internal drink bag, they developed a way to push soda from the can to your face without relying on gravity. Looking for a suitable test environment, they gave the local space agency a call. NASA agreed that this would be an interesting question to answer, and, not foreseeing any possibility that this could be exploited for publicity on Coca-Cola's part, agreed to let them fly their can on an early flight in their fledgling space shuttle program. Enter Pepsi, who caught wind of this experiment, and immediately foresaw the possibility that this could be exploited for publicity on Coca-Cola's part. And they wanted in. They immediately called NASA's mom and insisted they be invited to the sleepover, and had Coke's experiment delayed to a later flight so they had time to develop their own- wait, you already finished? This looks like a can of shaving cream. How much did you invest in this? 14 million dollars! Coke only spent a quarter of a million and it took them way longer to do it. You realize how implausible this number sounds? D look, we, we don't have time to interrogate this. Both cans, collectively making up the carbonated beverage dispenser evaluation experiment, were scheduled to launch aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger on flight STS-51F. NASA, most assuredly regretting the catfight they were now caught in the middle of, hastily worked out the details as to how the experiment would go. Concerns about the stunt marketing angle led the agency to try to limit the material they were sending back. There were discussions about covering the logos on the cans, or not taking video footage of the experiment. They also intended to limit the number of astronauts to drink from them. Their initial plan was to have the mission's two payload specialists, Lauren Acton and John David Bartow, be the only ones to do so. One problem. Bartow wanted absolutely no part in the experiment. Eventually, the dust settled and the plan came into focus. The mission's crew was divided into two shifts anyway, so they'd each get one drink to test. The blue shift would drink the Coke, while the red shift would drink Pepsi. 
The Wikipedia article for the mission is wrong, by the way. It gets which shift drank which soda backwards. Presumably because Coke is red and Pepsi is blue. But like, there's a sentence that's directly contradicted by a picture right next to it, as long as you just scroll up to figure out which shift Tony England was part of. I recognize that I could have corrected it myself, I just wanted to put it in the video instead. Moving on. On July 12th, 1985, with Coke and Pepsi cans aboard, Challenger prepared for its eighth flight into orbit, the 19th shuttle flight overall. The launch sequence began. Five, four, three, two. We have an two. RSLS abort. We have an RSLS abort. We have an abort. And then stopped because of a coolant valve failure. Shit. On July 29th, 1985, with Coke and Pepsi cans aboard, Challenger prepared for its eighth flight into orbit, the 19th shuttle flight overall. The launch sequence began. Five, Five four, four, three, three two, two, one. Ignition and liftoff. We have liftoff of Challenger. And liftoff was achieved. The flight began normally, until the five minute mark, when the center engine shut off due to multiple sensor failures. This ultimately forced the flight to abort to orbit, abandoning their intended orbital trajectory in favor of a lower orbit. This was the only in-flight abort ever performed across the entire shuttle program. Once things were settled, the real work began. The blue team, the day shift, drank first, and eight hours later, the red team would follow them. Photos were taken, results were recorded, and the American public would have to wait for the press conference after the mission to hear the results. While the crew was up there though, they figured they could also try doing some other experiments or whatever. Eventually, the crew returned home, and on August 14th, the word was out. Both of them kinda sucked. It turned out that the exact problem I mentioned at the beginning of the video was, in fact, a problem, and the reflux was deemed too much of an annoyance for the crew. The taste was fine, however, even though the cans weren't refrigerated and the blue team had to drink new Coke. As for the two designs, Coke's labor of love worked like a dream and dispensed the drink exactly as intended. Pepsi's shaving cream container, however, tended to introduce more fizziness, and they ended up using it as a toy, making soda balls to play with. You ever had Tang? I'm kind of in the mood for Tang right now. With the experiment technically proving that soda could be consumed in space, even though the astronauts did not enjoy it, Coca-Cola got right back to work, sending more of their cans to the Russian Mir space station in 1991, and making two separate attempts at a proper soda dispenser that would fly in 1995 and 1996. Pre-mixing the soda seemed to work fine, but mixing the drink in space did not. The astronauts still hated drinking it, though. This would be their last serious attempt to solve the soda problem before ultimately returning to what Pepsi had been doing the whole time, marketing the absolute shit out of everything. To hear payload specialist Lauren Acton tell it, Pepsi understood that this had nothing whatsoever to do with soda in space. It had to do with PR. Since the taste test, space has been a recurring theme for both companies in the marketing catalog. In addition to selling replicas of their cans and running advertisements to coincide with the launch, Pepsi would shoot a commercial aboard Mirror in 1996. And they would do some other things that people have probably made videos on in the past. Coke also sold replicas, and continues to tout themselves as the first soda tasted in space to this day conveniently leaving out the fact that they were followed by their biggest competitor eight hours later on the exact same flight. They would also keep up their ties to science and culture when they opened Club Cool at Disney's Epcot Center, which continues to surprise and disgust guests to this day. Drink the Beverly. Coke would also continue paying tribute to their original effort. In 2014, the original Space Cam made a comeback in an ad for the Olympics. It got a mention in this Russian ad from 2021 that chose to believe that the mere tasting came first and then again in 2022 to promote their space-flavored soda. Unfortunately, this time as an NFT. Gross. And that's that. A history of soda in space. It doesn't really work that well, and it's not even an interesting failure. And I don't have an ending for this video. Sabrina, get in here. Yeah? I need you to figure out a joke to end on. I got nothing. Do you want to go to Epcot? <laughs>